Leviticus chapter 17. Quick review. Leviticus 16 covered the Feast of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And that Day of Atonement shows us on the left the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's the gospel in Yom Kippur. Which brings us to the scapegoat, where the goat shall bear all their iniquities for us all and once for all. All sins, all people, all times. And that, of course, now drives us to chapter 17. And when we started this study, we mentioned that one of the key verses is Leviticus 17, 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. So we're going to talk about, first of all, where their sacrifices were being made. And this has impact uh, as the nations split and the northern nations no longer came down to the temple. It has impact when the Babylonian captivity occurred and people were all just swept away to Babylon. And then, of course, the dispersion. And then ultimately, 70 AD and the destruction of the temple. And there was no place to sacrifice. But at the time, this was it. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons and to all the people of Israel and say to them, this is the thing that the Lord has commanded. If any of the house of Israel kills an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp or kills it outside the camp, in other words, wherever you kill that animal for sacrifice and does not bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting, to offer it as a gift to the Lord in front of the tabernacle of the Lord. Blood guilt shall be imputed on that man. He has shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among his people. Now keep in mind, when we studied those offerings, there were the voluntary offerings, the burnt offering, the grain offering, and the peace offering, and then there were the mandatory offerings, the sin offering and the trespass offering. So somebody didn't have to have a sacrifice in terms of those first three, but when it came to the others, they were mandatory and they had to be brought to the tent of meeting. Fast forward in Solomon's time to the temple, Zerubbabel's time, Herod's time, to the temple. I underline that phrase, cut off from among his people, because that's going to have impact as we get into chapters 18 and 19. Keep in mind, at this time, Israel was the nation. As opposed to where we live today, the church is not the nation. Israel was the nation. And so when you were cut off from the people, you were cut off from everything. And it's unclear when you read that phrase, are they talking about, say, excommunication? Or are they talking about capital punishment? This is to the end. This is why. This is to the end that people of Israel may bring their sacrifices that they sacrificed in the open field, that they may bring them to the Lord, to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and sacrifice them as sacrifices of peace offerings to the Lord. So they're talking about voluntary offerings. And we mentioned over that, that study that when we see that priest, we should see Christ in that priest, but we should also see self in that priest. And so let's apply this to today. And that's why I have the phrase, I am a temple, notwithstanding Hebrews 10.25. The Bible says, know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and so when we apply Romans 12, which says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. We don't have to kill that beast. It's a living sacrifice. But when they say, bring it to the tent of meeting, I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. I don't have to do anything geographically outside of outside the norm. But then Hebrews 10, 25 says not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. If you're going to present your body holy and acceptable, do it whenever and wherever you are. Don't wait for Sunday morning. Sunday morning is meant for more than just presenting ourselves. Sunday morning is an opportunity for fellowship. Sunday morning is an opportunity for 
corporate prayer. Sunday morning is an opportunity for corporate worship. Sunday morning is an opportunity for us to begin that day. And I don't know that we're going to get there today, but we're going to soon be talking about the Sabbath. And the Bible says, let no one judge you over feasts or Sabbaths. But Sunday is a special day. We'll get to that. So the place of sacrifice is wherever you are and whenever you are. And the peace offering is there because you've already been cleansed. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And the priest shall throw the blood on the altar of the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting and burn the fat for a pleasing aroma to the Lord so that they no more sacrifice their sacrifices to goat meat demons. Now, the Hebrew word here is seir, which is one step away from the Greek word seder, not to be confused with the Passover meal. Seder Greek is S-A-T-Y-R. Notice that phrase, no more, so that they shall no more sacrifice their sacrifices. What this is telling me is those people for 430 years, they lived in Egypt, they ate like Egyptians, they worshiped like Egyptians. We're going to see a phrase in just a few clicks that talk about Egypt and behind them and Canaan in front of them. And this is a precursor to that because it's saying no more pagan worship like Egypt, the world where you were, and then we go to the Greeks that have taken over after the Persians, after the Babylonians and the Persians took over, but it's no more in your future either. What this is telling me is I was anything but wonderful before I was saved. I worshiped everybody and everything but the God Almighty. Jesus saved me of my sins. Now, fast forward, and here I am in front of you guys. Sin still dwells within me, and I have to pay attention who my God is and where my sacrifices are, are dedicated. So, so they shall no more sacrifice their sacrifices to goat demons. And of course, there you have a picture of the, the, uh, the goat god of Egypt, and that's Yedet and futuristically, the pan, the Greek god. After whom they whore, this shall be a statute forever for them. The word whore is first mentioned in Exodus 24, and it's not talking about female prostitution or male prostitution. It's talking about idolatry. It's talking about putting another god in front of our god and our Lord and our Savior. And so with that as its picture, keep in mind the law first mentioned is when the word is first mentioned, it carries on that same kind of thought throughout scripture. You can understand in Homer and, and Hosea and Gomer, I was going to say Gomer and Hosea, <laughs> Hosea and Gomer, you could understand how he told that man, not just Go and find a wife. It seems like matrimony is either ignored these days or taken very lightly these days. But he said to Hosea, go and marry that prostitute. And then watch her return to her ways. And Hosea, when you feel that pain, that's the pain that I feel. That's the pain that I, Yahweh, feel when you're out pouring away from me. I'm making my way now in my readings through Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and it has so many metaphors. The, the Israel is like a donkey in heat, is, and just go on and on. And God is hurt. The Bible refers to him as a jealous God, and it refers to him as an angry God. And we're not immune from being the object of his jealousy and his anger. And you shall say to them, you Moses, you say to the people of Israel, any one of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among them 
who offers a burnt offering or sacrifice and does not bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting or to offer it to the Lord, that man shall be cut off from his people. You see that phrase again. And so there's the command that we're supposed to worship and how we're supposed to worship and where we're supposed to worship. But then in the nation, in the case of Israel, and we're going to bring it to today, then in the case of Israel, they go from bad to worse. I picked out Gideon because Big Gideon was the one who was winnowing wheat in the wine press. He was hiding from the Midianites. But when God got his attention, he went out and he took out his chainsaw and he cut down all those Ashtaroth poles. He goes from Gideon to Solomon. Now, I have to believe the Bible that says Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. But I'm going to tell you something. Anybody that has a thousand women on the string can't be all that brilliant. But yet he decided he was going to hedge his bets. By the time he came to the end of his career, he was sacrificing to Yahweh. And he was sacrificing to all those other guys as well. Then we come to Jeroboam and the northern tribes. Jeroboam said, we're not going to go back down to Jerusalem. We're going to set up an altar in Dan on the north end and an altar at Bethel on the south end. And we're going to worship here. We're even going to sign up our own priests. Then we come to Manasseh. Manasseh was the one. Now, there were, he was on the southern kingdom. He was a, a, a king of Judah. And there were good kings that followed Manasseh. But Manasseh was such a dirt ball that he was the reason that God did not repent. He said, the, Babylons are, the Babylonians are coming whether you like it or not. So, okay, the Jewish people, the Hebrews were guilty of human sacrifice. I tried looking for the number of all the recorded abortions during the reign of Roe versus Wade. And if you do that same search, you're going to find all kinds of different numbers because the fine print that you can't read, they say, well, we kind of assumed this and we kind of did this. But don't worry about the small print. Don't worry about the rough number. 63 million people. One-sixth of our current national population. So here's an article from Time magazine. And if you just look at that statistic, legal abortion is down by 96% in states with, where most restrictions have been put in place since the end of Roe versus Wade. Now, you could look at that statistic and say, yay! But the article was saying, we've got work to do. We, the, the pro-abortion people, have got work to do. We're losing all those battles. And then we come to very current events, in vitro fertilization. Who's familiar with the court case in Alabama? Okay, roughly half. There was a family that had fertilized embryos for future IVF in vitro fertilization. And through some chain of events, they thawed and died and they sued for wrongful death. And the state of Alabama, the state Supreme Court, held them up and said, yes, life is at the moment of conception. That is wrongful death. Read the news since then. Different politicians are weighing in. They're saying, I support this. I don't support this. The heart of the question is this. When does life begin? You don't say it's okay because somebody was the victim of rape or incest. The doctors have already proven that uh, in, in the case of the health of the mother, they've, they've, technology has gone past that. They can deal with both the baby and the mother. But when you take those eggs and you take that sperm and you fertilize, I don't know how many of them, and then you decide to start calling, call, call, C-U-L-L, culling them down based upon the sex of the baby you want, the color of its hair, the color of its eyes, and they can tell all those things. That's murder. That's where we are today. And so do you think God is angry? Now, 
I can see somebody saying that poor couple, they can't have babies. There are people all through scripture that couldn't have babies. And there are kids everywhere that need parents. I don't think we're going to get there today. But chapter 19 deals with slavery in the Bible. And yes, we've had the Emancipation Proclamation, and we've got Juneteenth, but there's still a lot of human trafficking going on inside this United States. Estimates are anywhere between 400,000 and 2 million slaves inside the United States, and a lot of those are sex slaves. So that's where we are, bad to worse. So we've seen this slide before, and we've seen that verse before, but I wanted to talk about people refer to Christianity as a bloody religion. And I've done some searches and I use the King James because the other translations are famous for synonyms. The word blood or bloody occurs in the Bible almost 500 times. You can read the math. Right on down to this one chapter, 13 times just in this one chapter. But then we have Christ's precious blood. Of course, it's referred to several, several times, and we're going to be looking at those times, but once for all. I find that amazing. He died for all the people, all the time, all the sins, everywhere, past, present, and future. And when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, people marvel, and they say, well, why is that just the only way? What's remarkable is that there is a way. Now, that's a picture of what my, my, my Bible looks like around Leviticus 17, 11. And we're going to step through all those different scriptures talking about the blood of Christ. And nobody went for their pens, so just enjoy what we're about to say. The blood of Christ. First, we're redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Now, why the ESV decided up above to change redeemed to ransomed, I don't know. Because you come to this next verse, which is ESV, and they use the word redemption. And so we are redeemed by the blood. We're forgiven through his blood. We are justified by his blood. We have peace through his blood. That's a bloody religion. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We're cleansed by the blood, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We're freed by his blood. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins. The Bible says that we're supposed to cast our cares upon him, for he careth for you. And my problem is I cast him, and then I pick him right back up again. We're going to shortly talk about sin. One of the definitions of sin is that which is not of faith is sin. And so when I doubt and when I worry, I sin, even though I've been freed from sin by his blood. I'm sanctified by his blood, but notice that's an imperfect tense. That means continue to sanctify. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. I'm a promise with a capital P. We have access through the blood. We have confidence to enter the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus. We have victory. Oh, victory in Jesus. He plunged me. I love that song. We sang it on the way to church this morning. And they have conquered him. We're more than conquerors. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. You know, it's a good thing to memorize scripture. 
We're going to talk about it Friday morning, Mark, memorizing scripture. I had two back surgeries. My second back surgery, I'm laying on that gurney. They put the pre-anesthetic or anesthesia inside of you. So I don't know if I was in my right mind, but I knew I was going to die in that operating room and go to hell. So what did I do? Scriptures. And that's the scripture that came up. And they conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word. And I had peace. And here I am. Glory everlasting through the blood. The book of Ephesians says that he's going to show forth his kindness towards us in his ages to come. And I don't know how that's going to be. I don't know if he's going to unravel it little by little because I still have trouble grasping the notion of eternity outside of time. But the Bible says they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. The life is in the blood. Leviticus 17, 11. So that brings us to an interesting juncture in the book of Leviticus. You see that red line right down the center? It separates the way to God versus the walk with God. We've been talking about the sacrifices. We've been talking about the priestly garments. We've been talking about how we can be pure. All those things come to a capstone on the Day of Atonement. But now we're going to shift gears when we move from chapter 17 to chapter 18. And you see a verse there from Amos. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Now, God's not going to change his mind based on my opinions. Who's going to have to do the changing? You know, yours truly. Which brings us to the point of holiness. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 says that we're to be conformed to the image of his dear son. He's not going to conform to me. I have to conform to him. And so you see that the topics there, holy people, holy priests, holy times, holy vows. Very simple approach to holiness is my want to versus my have to. Dr. Dobson told this story years ago, guaranteed I'll get all the details wrong. But two young ladies were in a car accident. Both ladies needed plastic surgery on their faces. Both ladies were beauties, as the world defines beauty, before the accident. But after the accident, both were slightly disfigured. Both were engaged to be married. Have to say that at that time, you didn't ask the question, were they engaged to each other? They were engaged to two different guys. The first guy comes into the hospital and he sees his bride to be and he goes, ooh. The second fiance comes in and he sees his bride to be with her lips, sort of like half of an X. He moved his lips in the other direction and he gave her a kiss and he said, it's kind of cute. That's being conformed to your partner. It's a want to, not a have to. And so when we go through these different laws, we need to have the want to in our brains. And when you read these different things independently, again, my mind goes back to my first pastor with his arthritic hand, and he could point to everybody in the church all at the same time. And when he's talking about sin A, I'm convicted of sin Z. For when we're reading Leviticus on our own. So there you see chapters 1 through 17. We'll go to the bottom first. All the rituals for worship. And we went through them in painstaking detail. Now on the right, chapters 18 through 27, we're talking about practical ways of living. Now when we go through those things, there are going to be some things that you're going to say, well, I don't need about worrying about my marrying my mother-in-law. She's dead and gone. And if she were alive, I got my bride right here. On the other hand, there are some things there that are very near and dear. 
The ones on the left talk about the offerings and the priests and cleansing. And the ones on the light, right are guidelines for daily living. Keep in mind, the Bible says that everyone is to be convinced in their own mind. We'll get to those. You've seen this slide before. What's the purpose of the law? It's to restrain the wicked. It's to teach us. And it's to be a standard. And you've seen this slide before. The law drives us to salvation, but then salvation draws us to the law, being conformed to his image. And so you see this slide, which we've seen before, live through Jesus, live for Jesus. But here's the punchline. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who live in Christ Jesus. We're starting on this verse that was in chapter 11. We're going to revisit it in chapter, uh, chapter 18, and it's quoted again in chapter 19. Be holy, for I am holy. So Paul wrote to Timothy, and we've seen this whole slide before, but this is the springboard to what we're about to talk about today. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity, which begs the question, what is iniquity? What is sin? Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Talked about that already. In Wednesday night Bible study, we're talking about faith the size of a mustard seed. We talked already about the storm, and Jesus said to those apostles, Oh, ye of little faith. James says this, Therefore to him that knoweth too good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Well, how do I get to know what is good to do? Read your Bibles. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And then you see this one. Sin is the transgression of the law. Can't get away from that law thing. So what is iniquity? What is sin? Is it, when we say sin is the transgression of the law, is it the whole law? Do portions of the law still apply? Which portions of the law still apply? Here you read in Matthew, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Doesn't say to eradicate them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth shall pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Well, you can sit there and say, well, he said it is finished, that it was all accomplished. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, all has not yet been accomplished. He paid for my sins. He gave me the keys to the kingdom. He promised that he'd never leave me nor forsake me. But there's still a sin nature inside of himself. We're going to see a verse from Ephesians, let the thief steal no more. I'm still a sinner. And I still sin until that last enemy is destroyed. So there's law. Well, how can I say that there's still law? Well, Jesus died. He was gone. The, uh, the uh, uh, gospels are closed down. There's the act of the possible. And then all these epistles talk about sin and talk about the law. So the law is still around. What is the law? We talk about what is iniquity, what is sin, what is the law? Well, it's broken down. These are human constructs. There's not, it's not spelled out that way in scripture, but you can look at it by this kind of an angle, the ceremonial law, the dietary law, and the moral law. So the ceremonial law, there you see Romans 7, 24 and Romans 8, 1. You're going to see that on the top of several slides. Romans 7, 24 says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? You already saw Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. So my priestly robes have been replaced with the whole armor of God, but we're still called upon for daily sacrifices. And you've seen this verse again and again and again as we study Leviticus. And we're also called upon a continual prayer life. Rejoice always. 
Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Then we take a look at the dietary law. And again, the same thing, old wretched man that I am. And Acts chapter 10 talks about Peter. He's on the rooftop of the, the tanner and the tablecloth that comes down. It's filled with all those things. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again and said a second time, what God has made clean do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up once to heaven. See, well, I don't have to worry about cloven hoofs and chewing the cud and the other thing and this thing. And yet I'm addicted to junk food. And on occasion, I'm a glutton. The Bible says, "Are you? do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within whom you are from God? You are not your own. You are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Yeah, I don't have to worry about not eating shellfish. I don't have to worry about not eating pork, a couple of my favorites I just rattled off. But the Bible says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Keep in mind, I want to come back again to your want to versus your have to. Right before I was married, shame on me for letting this fall apart. But right before I was married, I tried everything I could possibly do to please her. I brushed my teeth. I shaved, still doing those things almost 50 years later. I used deodorant. I didn't have to do those things. I wanted to do those things. I have to put that flavor into these things. So there you see the verses that I had referred to. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That in chapter 7 is Paul wrestling with his sin nature. He says, the things that I want to do, I, I don't get around to doing them. The things I do want to do them, I don't do them. Wretched man that I am. Capital punishment with an exclamation point. We're going to soon see a slide, capital punishment with a question mark. Capital punishment, the wages of sin is death. So we're going to go at this thing from two angles. First, James says, if a person's guilty of a portion of the law, they're guilty of the whole law. So if you break one of those things, the wages of sin is death. We're going to look at it from the other angle because we're going to show down here, and I'll click one time just to get you started. We're going to see here all the different things that called for capital punishment in the Mosaic Law. And I'm not going to go through them blow by blow. You can read faster than I can talk. But you're going to find something in this list that you've broken. Look at number eight as an example. The wages of sin is death. We all deserve to die. And the list continues on. I find chapter uh, number 17 really, really interesting because if the Hebrews had done that, the nation of Israel had been wiped out in one generation. Continues on. Capital punishment. Whoever, sends, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made him in his own image. Now, in the Old Testament, they had the avenger of blood. And you know the story of Abner and Azahel. Azahel was the little brother of Joab, and he decided he was going to go try to kill Abner. And he chases Abner, chases Abner. And Abner says, Azahel, stay away, stay away. And as they came close, he put the butt end of a spear up there in self-defense. Azahel runs onto the spear and dies, and Joab decides he's going to hunt down Abner. Fast forward to today. You can read all of Romans, but I want to come down to just the very bottom. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. The sword at that time was the means of capital punishment. Today, it could be hanging. It could be lethal injection. It could be electrical. Uh, it could be uh, the electric chair. 
or it can be life in prison. The book of Ecclesiastes says that a just judgment not quickly performed leads people's minds to evil. What's the worst if I get caught? Three hots, three cot, three hots in the cot. And so that's where we are. Capital punishment, question mark. You have heard that it is said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. If I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. I'm guilty. I've told you many times my two Achilles heel are anger and impatience. You've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in her heart. If I click backwards, you can see both of these were capital punishment. Holiness is the answer to everything that we've gone through thus far this morning. Live for Jesus. Galatians 3 says this, and as we click through these verses, you're going to see the same thrust back and back and back and back about the law. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian. King James says schoolmaster. So the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Does that mean I'm playing hooky? Or does that mean I've graduated and no longer need that schoolmaster? Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Against such, there is no law. What that means is, if I'm feasting on the fruit of the Spirit, I don't need to worry about those things because my mind is in Christ. First Timothy, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Paul said, what should we sin then that grace might abound? God forbid. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. Not all things build up NIV. Not all things are edifieth. All things are lawful, but I will, be do I will not be dominated by anything. So why is there a moral law? We've talked about the ceremonial law. We talked about the dietary law. And now we have the moral law. First of all, why? He gives the answer, I am the Lord. In parlance of my family, why, Dad? Because I'm the dad. They get a little bit bolder and they say, why, Dad? It's because I weigh 200 pounds and you weigh 40. Why? I am the Lord. You've seen this slide before. The moral law. Why the moral law? Because God is concerned about our salvation. Not just my done deal. I've got a reserved seat in heaven. But my ongoing purification, sanctification. The life is in the flesh and I have given it for you. He's not just concerned about my salvation. He's concerned about my health. You know, if a body kept himself pure until marriage and then only had sex inside the, the marriage, he's got like 0.000% chance of a sexually transmitted disease. On the other hand, I've heard it said, if you have sex with somebody, you've had sex with everybody, that person has sex with it for the past seven years. So God is telling us, and it's, it's not just Old Testament, it's New Testament. The New Testament says, marriage is honorable all in all, and the bed is undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. I was flying one time back from San Francisco. I was out there uh, for work for a long period of time, so I had to check my bag. 
And I'm sitting in baggage claim, and I just finished six hours of reading my scripture. It was wonderful. It's a six-hour flight. So needless to say, I have to wait for my bag. I go down to baggage claim. I find myself a seat. I open my Bible. Hebrews 13, 5. Marriage is honorable in all. And this lady walks up. She had a dress no larger than a washcloth in my bathroom. And she sits down right next to me. And she says, what are you reading? And I pointed to it and I read it out loud. And she said, well, to be technical, we're not adulterers. We're fornicating. I got up and walked off. God's concerned about our salvation. He's concerned about our health. And he's concerned about our witness. So, I had that big red bar between chapter 17 and chapter 18, the way to God and the walk with God. And the very first thing God wants to get off his chest are unlawful sexual relations. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you've been. And you shall not do as you do in the land of Canaan where you're headed. Whether it's my past, my present, or my future, God is telling me something. You shall not walk in their statutes. Now, I could say, you shall not walk in their laws. Acts 5.29 is Peter saying to the Sanhedrin, it's better to obey God rather than man. And there are some laws now on the books that are horrific. Our country is being dissembled right before our very eyes. And the question becomes, who am I going to follow? It's better to obey God rather than men. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. Why? I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules, and if a person does them, he shall live by them. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor adulterers nor adulterer nor, neither sexually immoral nor idolaters. I keep getting those words messed up. God must have invented those words just for me to, to have them so close to each other. Nor idolaters nor adulterers nor men who practice sexual uh, practice homosexuality. Neither thieves nor the greedy nor drunks nor revilers nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Now, it's not those things up above that damn a person. It's rejecting Jesus Christ that will damn a person. But I want to give you something about homosexuality. I know a man, he's much older now, but when he was young, he was engaged to be married. He was a Christian. He was a virgin. And as he was coming closer to the wedding date, he realized that he could not satisfy his partner. He broke off the wedding, but he never did practice homosexuality. He had a bent in that direction, but yet... He chose to live chaste. Just like there are heterosexuals who many are called to be chaste. Just like there are heterosexuals that have a desire, but yet they live chaste. Let the thief no longer steal. It doesn't say let the thief no longer be a thief. The sin nature is there. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. 